Okay, so now we're going to move to poll question number two. Do you and your partner currently have any joint accounts? As Stephanie mentioned in the right-hand side, you can see the poll. If you could please record your, question, your response, that would be great. All right, so let's take a look at some money talks once you're engaged or once you're moving into some um, longer-term commitments together. <clears throat> a lot of people ask us whether or not they should join together their accounts. In fact, a client just asked me yesterday. She said specifically, I came to the table with um, a lot of, my, my fiance and I just got engaged, and I came to the table with a lot of savings. I have enough money for a down payment, I have no debt, and I'm feeling really good about my situation. I love my fiance, but he has a lot of student loan debt. He went to law school, and he also has credit card debt. Should we join together all of our accounts, and should I start making payments on his debt? That is a fantastic question, and I can tell you quite honestly that the answer depends on each financial situation. If you're going to join together your finances, I've got a couple of tips on how you can join together accounts and some of the pros and cons of doing joint versus keeping things separate. If you're going to have a joint checking and a joint savings, some of the really obvious pros is that you clearly have open communication. You can easily see where money goes, how closely you're sticking to a budget, and most importantly, how much money you're getting saved or going towards your debt repayment plans. On the flip side, you don't have as much privacy. For instance, if you want to buy a Christmas gift, <laughs> that transaction is going to be reported in your joint account. Uh, but you, and you don't always have the same amount of independence that you might have had financially when you didn't have joint accounts. Some clients tell us that it's easier just to keep things totally separate. In that case, of course, it prevents there from being any situations where you might have spending judgment, which I know for a lot of us can be very difficult. On the flip side, it really does mean that you're probably not as aware of your overall household financial health. It does mean that you're going to have to sit down and ask a lot of questions about whether or not money got saved, if it went towards debt repayment, because you aren't going to necessarily be able to see that by looking at joint accounts. One reason that you would keep things totally separate, potentially, is if you, if you have a lot of outside obligations, maybe one or both of you pays child support or alimony from a prior marriage. One strategy that you can use if both of these sound like they might work is to kind of do a combination. So maybe you have some of your money in a joint account, some checking, some savings, et cetera, but you also maintain separate accounts so that when it comes time to buy birthday gifts or spend money on the fly, you've got a little independence to do that. And remember, the reality is no one system is perfect for everybody. You should figure out what works best for you, your personalities, and your relationships. And if you put one system in place and it doesn't really work, you should try something new. So we have the results of the poll, and it actually looks like half and half. Uh, half of you have joint accounts and about half of you don't, which is really interesting. And uh, as you think through the strategies that we laid out here for you, joint may be an option for you, or you could do the combo approach that, that Stephanie mentioned if you don't currently have joint accounts. Yeah, thanks everybody for responding. That information is really interesting. So one of the questions we see often, and it's becoming more and more common, is whether or not couples should get a prenup before they get married. I think this is a great question to ask because I'm not sure that everybody necessarily knows what a prenup is even for. Remember when we talked about cohabitation agreements earlier? A prenuptial agreement is similar, but it's much broader because it covers things like assets that you may have had before you got married, in addition to things like assets and debts that you accumulate during marriage. It might feel a little bit unromantic to be talking about having a plan like this in advance, but I can tell you that it does encourage both of you to open up and talk about your finances. And it really is a good type of protection to have in place if one person has a very significant amount of wealth when they come to the table. To be honest, in the long run, having a prenuptial agreement does have some cost savings if things don't ultimately work out. If you've got some additional questions about um, prenuptial agreements, LearnVest has a Getting Hitched Boot Camp, which not only talks about a lot of different money conversations to have before you get married, it specifically covers prenuptial agreements. A couple things that would be covered by a prenup in case you've never encountered one. It'll talk about how you'd split up your finances and split up certain items within your household. It'll talk about what to do with debt. It'll cover types of financial support for a partner and may go into things like payment support, like alimony, for example. And we'll also touch on how to handle inheritance for kids from previous marriage. If you're thinking that you might need a prenup, here are probably the top five reasons that most people get them. 
your partner has a high load of debt, or maybe you do. One of you owns your own business. One of you plans to quit your job to raise children. One or both of you are remarrying, or one of you brings a lot more significant wealth to the table. If, on the other hand, you are pretty much in the same place financially today, you feel like your assets are pretty equal, and you make similar salaries, a prenup might not be anything that you need to worry about. Again, if bringing up the, the conversation about a prenuptial agreement is uncomfortable for you, blame it on LearnVest. You can always reference that you read an article, you attended the webinar, or you can also just bring up that, hey, did you know I saw a statistic? And sometimes that's a casual way to just get into the conversation. We've talked a lot about different life stages and different money talks that you would have along the way. So let's talk for a minute about what to do when a wedding is on the horizon. You want to know, of course, who's contributing to the big day. And this is potentially one of life's most significant expenses so far. It's a modern age, and I'm not going to make any assumptions about who's going to necessarily be paying for your wedding. So here's what I would suggest that you and your significant other sit down and talk about. First of all, what are your financial priorities? Is it that you really want to have a day you'll never forget? I think all of us want that in some ways. But would you rather maybe have a jump start towards financial success? Maybe you want to buy a house, and the money you would have put towards a wedding, perhaps part of that could go towards a down payment. These are all decisions that you're going to have to make together. I saw a recent survey on the not.com. It was really interesting. It said that the average cost of a wedding today is $27,000. That's a lot of money for one day. We had a Learn Best article recently that was also very interesting. There was a woman who had a wedding for $4,000. She actually had more than 100 guests. So it certainly just goes to show that you can have an amazing day to remember at all different price points. What I want to encourage you guys to think about if you're in this situation is how to pool resources. Find out if family is going to participate in any of your wedding costs. And then talk to each other about whether or not paying for the wedding is potentially going to deplete emergency savings, or even if you might have to take out debt to pay for the wedding. You do want to start off your life together on the right financial foot. And when you talk for your first time about your wedding, it, it's OK if you disagree initially. That's why you're talking about it. Stephanie had mentioned earlier about the bottle of wine. I think that's a great idea. You should really nail down your budget as the first step, and then figure out exactly what it is about the big day that's important to you. So you can decide exactly what you want to spend and how much you want to spend. I got married last year, Jennifer, and I can remember very clearly that it was really exciting but also very emotional. So it's adding on the emotion of the wedding itself to the emotion of talking about money, which can get pretty complicated really easily. The thing is, you're starting your life together. And as much as this big day is very important, you don't want it to be in conflict with the big financial goals that you've already set together. Chase actually offers some resources with our Blueprint program that it enables you to pay large purchases off more quickly. And if you're one of the millions of Chase customers, you can use this free feature to set up a plan to help you establish good credit card spending and budgeting habits. You can have a customized plan for you, specifically, where you can decide how much do you want to pay each month or how, over what period of time do you want to pay something off. So for your wedding, if you're putting a large purchase like your wedding dress or your wedding band or a cake on your credit card, you can make a plan to pay them off. And then you'll receive a statement each month, and you can see what your progress is against that plan until it's paid off. I think having a plan in place, Jennifer, is so essential at so many different stages of life. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that. 